Hello everyone, let's begin our notes on conservation biology. Go ahead and download the notes document from Google Classroom into Notability or grab a paper copy of the notes. Let's begin. So the value of biodiversity. Biodiversity is the sum total of the variety of all organisms in the biosphere. The total amount of variety of organisms in the biosphere. Remember, the biosphere is made up of the atmosphere, the geosphere or the land, and the hydrosphere or the water. So biodiversity really means all of the different organisms on the earth that live in either the land, the water, or in the air. And biodiversity is super important for us to protect. Um, there are three different kinds of biodiversity that we're gonna talk about today. The first type, and you're gonna go ahead and fill this in in the table in your guided notes. So right next to ecosystem diversity, the first type of diversity, in that table, you're gonna write this. Ecosystem diversity includes the variety of habitats or an organism's home, community, the different organisms in that habitat, and ecological processes in the living world. So cellular respiration, fermentation, photosynthesis, um, those are things that are processes that help the living world, the nutrient cycles, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, water cycle, those are the living processes that we're talking about. So it's really important that we have diversity, not just in our biosphere as a whole, but that our ecosystems are different because each different habitat that we find, whether it's the North Pole or the desert or the rainforest, it's made up of a group of unique organisms and processes, climate, all of those things. And we really value having that diversity. The next type of diversity is called species diversity. So species diversity is like it sounds, it's the number of different species in the biosphere. So this kind of goes hand in hand with ecosystem diversity. If you have a diverse ecosystem, you're going to have diverse species within that ecosystem. So many different species that live in that place. And with that, we also have genetic diversity. So genetic diversity is within one species, the total of all the different forms of genetic information carried by those organisms living on Earth today. So within that one species, think of the human species. Think about how much different genetic diversity there is in just the human species alone. No two people look exactly alike, with the exception of identical twins. No two people look exactly alike. So there is a lot of genetic diversity. And that is important because genetic diversity helps species to adapt and to change over time. We're gonna learn more about this topic in the, at the end of the year when we talk about our unit on evolution. So we're gonna kind of table that for now. What I really wanna focus on is the ecosystem diversity for today, because that is the type of diversity that is really at risk of being abused um, by humans. So biodiversity or ecosystem diversity is actually considered one of Earth's greatest natural resources. Just like fossil fuels, water, sunlight, anything that humans use as part of the earth for our benefit is considered a natural resource. And biodiversity is one of those things. There are a couple ways that humans use biodiversity as a resource. You can just write down one example. But the examples we have are as food, right? You eat a variety of different foods. You don't just eat one thing. Um, industrial products, think wood, um, other um, cosmetic products, things that we can make through using living things. Um, and lastly, medicine. So different types of antibiotics, antidepressants, heart drugs, painkillers, anti-cancer drugs. All of these have been utilized, have utilized different living things, whether it's bacteria or plants or even animals 
and the testing that we're able to do with that. So that has given us the resource of medicine. Who knows, the cure for cancer could even be out there. We just haven't found it yet. And say a flower in the middle of the rainforest that we just haven't discovered. So it is one of Earth's greatest natural resources. But because it's a resource and because humans can tend to be a little selfish in the way we use our resources, we are actually threatening the resource of biodiversity. So there are four ways that we're gonna to discuss today that humans are threatening biodiversity. Human activity can reduce biodiversity by altering habitats, by cutting down forests or building streets or developments, we are altering the habitats of those creatures that live there. By hunting species to extinction, when a species is endangered, there are obviously laws in place in order to prevent them from being hunted, but people don't always follow the law. Think the elephants being hunted for their ivory tusks or the whales being hunted for all kinds of different properties, medicinal, um, religious, for food. Unfortunately, that is happening. Then we have pollution, which we all play a role in pollution. We'll talk more about that on another slide. And lastly, introducing foreign species to new environments. I was talking about the Burmese python in our last section of notes, and that is considered a foreign species to the Florida Everglades. And it is a invasive species because of the way it is able to grow and thrive in that environment. So let's talk a little bit more about extinction because extinction is really the threat that we face with biodiversity. And that is when a species disappears from all or part of its range. So sometimes you can have an extinct species that still exists, but it's living in the zoo or it's living under captivity. That's still considered an extinct species because it's no longer living in its natural habitat or its range. So another word for range would be habitat. A species that is in danger of extinction because its population size is declining is called an endangered species. Unfortunately, if a species makes it onto the endangered species list, more often than not, it ends up going extinct. Um, there are a few cases where a species is able to come off of the endangered list and cut back to normal because humans intervene, but most of the time it does end up going extinct. There are actually more extinct species on the earth right now today than there are living species on the earth. The reason that endangerment is so dangerous for species is because as an endangered species declines, it's losing its genetic diversity. So it's less able to adapt and change over time as the environment around it changes. So that is the danger of extinction. And extinction can occur because we alter habitats, but it can also occur because of pollution. So one of the most serious problems occurs when toxic compounds accumulate or increase in the tissues of organisms. Unfortunately, plastic pollution is a huge problem facing our oceans and our ocean animals. The sea turtles are eating tiny bits of microplastic and that's accumulating, it's gathering up inside their stomach and it's giving them cancer and it's causing them to die. Um, waste pollution and chemical pollution can lead to something called biological magnification. So as say mercury, which is a chemical pollutant, when mercury enters the food chain, it enters at the bottom of the food chain here in the water because maybe waste or chemicals get dumped into the water. As it goes up the food chain into the algae, the producers, then into the algae insects, then into the insect eating insects, into the fish, into the fish eating fish, and then lastly into the humans. As it goes up the food chain, the concentration of mercury increases until it is at a dangerous level for human consumption. So tuna fish would be one of these giant fish eating fish. This is tuna. 
And tuna fish is something that we need to pay attention to that we don't consume too much of because it does contain a high level, high concentration of mercury, which is harmful to human health. So if you do like tuna, if you like your tuna salad, you like your fish sticks, you like your too spicy tuna sushi, you can still eat it, but you do need to make sure that you're not eating too much of it. Along those lines too, if any of you have cats, you need to make sure that your cat's cat food does not have too much tuna either because it can accumulate into harmful levels in your pets as well. So that is because of pollution and we all can play a role in helping to reduce or eliminate the amount of plastic that ends up in the water that leads to this pollution. Maybe we don't use the single use plastic like plastic water bottles. Instead, you get yourself a Nalgene and you use that every day. Um, it's very hard to completely rid ourselves of plastic. You look around, almost everything has a little bit of plastic in it, but if we can get rid of using that single use throwaway plastic, that packaging um, in the things that you buy at the store, that can really help out in the long run. So the next thing that is threatening our species diversity is through introducing species that are not native to a particular habitat. So when plants and animals that humans transport around the world, sometimes accidentally, but sometimes intentionally, if they find a habitat where they can thrive without a predator, they are gonna be called an invasive species or they're gonna become an invasive species. Invasive species are dangerous because they reproduce rapidly because their natural habitat lacks predators that would help to control their population. So they can take off and reproduce at that exponential growth rate that we talked about in our last section of notes. Then they are taking away the resources from the other animals that are native to that area. A couple examples, you can write down one of these, would be the uh, Burmese python. So here's an example, the Burmese python in the Everglades. Purple loosestrife is the pretty purple plant that you see on the side of the highway. That was brought here intentionally by humans because they thought it was pretty, um, but it is not native to this area, but it takes over. And unfortunately, the bees do not pollinate the purple loosestrife the way that they pollinate the native plants. And if you've seen Bee Movie, you know what happens when there's no flowers for the bees to pollinate, then the food chain crumbles because those are our producers and they need to be pollinated in order to provide food for the rest of the animals on the planet. So the Burmese python, purple loosestrife, even rats, right? Rats are not native to the United States. They came here on ships from England. They climbed into the cargo of the ships back in the day when we had colonies here in America and that is how rats came a part of our um, communities. So here's three examples, one, two, three. You can just write down one example on your notes for an invasive species. There are plenty of others, but those are the ones we're gonna talk about. You'll notice from this next graph that the area of threat from invasive species is actually, unfortunately, concentrated pretty greatly in our part of the country. Um, our part of the world, really. Um, and it does come a lot from Europe over here, and they go back and forth. Where there's a lot of travel between countries, that's when we do see a lot of threat from invasive species. So this is actually the reason why if you travel to another country and you come back and you go through customs, they ask you if you are carrying any biological matter, if you have any plants or animals, and it's to help prevent this from occurring. So it is very important that you never take anything that is living back from another country and introduce it to the ecosystem around you. So those are four ways that we can harm biodiversity, but that doesn't mean that humans are only harming. We're also working to help conserve biodiversity. So there are plenty of ecologists at work trying to help protect the biodiversity in our ecosystems. So that is a field called conservation. And conservation is the wise management of natural resources, including the preservation of habitats and wildlife. So you may have seen this little logo before the WWF, that's the World Wildlife Foundation, Save the Pandas. 
Um, and we often say, save the pandas, save the sea turtles. It makes for a nice t-shirt. It looks like a great sticker. But really what conservationists are working to do is to preserve the entire ecosystem where that particular organism lives. So instead of just, you know, save the sea turtle, let's work to protect the ocean ecosystem. And in turn, if you're protecting the entire ecosystem, that's going to ensure that the natural habitats and all of the interactions of the many different species in that habitat are preserved at the same time. Because species don't just live in isolation. Think back to our whole note section on species interactions. Species live closely together. There's predator-prey relationships. There's symbiosis relationships, competition. All of those biotic and abiotic factors in an ecosystem that work to keep an organism or a species alive. And so you can't just work to save one species, you have to work to preserve the entire ecosystem. But that's really difficult. A lot of times preserving ecosystems, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of research, and it takes a lot of money. So a couple of the challenges that conservationists come about when they're trying to make these regulations is that their regulations have to be informed by solid research. That's the first thing, because you're not going to convince anybody with money to help you unless you have solid research to back up your plan for conservation. They also have to maximize the benefit, maximizing the benefit for the ecosystem, but also for the people who are going to be affected by this conservation change. And lastly, it needs to minimize economic cost. And it can be really, really hard um, to convince people because they need to change the way that they are living, but also the way that they're earning money today. And some of our the biggest money makers in the world are the people who are drilling for oil, the fossil fuel factories and things like that. They're the ones making a lot of money. And unfortunately, in society, we see that the people who make a lot of money are the people who also make a lot of the decisions. So we're kind of fighting an uphill battle here as conservationists to try to push back against that, to say, no, it's important that we help to conserve the resources that we have on our planet today because they are not going to be around forever. And yes, that's not going to affect you and I. We are going to be long gone before this world implodes, but we need to work to preserve what we have so that our children and our children's children and the generations that come after us have a place to live that's not just burning on fire or filled with trash. Think the movie WALL-E, okay? It's not going to happen. We are not going to be out in a spaceship station in order to live. We need to work to preserve the resources we have on the earth right now.